the Down Beach Buzz webcast. We got Sherry Lillianfeld here from EXP Realty. We got some videos here, Sherry. It's like uh, I want to do a reaction video with you. You probably have seen that on TikTok or whatever. I don't. I don't have a TikTok account actually, but I can. I can react to a video. What do you think about the amount of mortgage fraud that's on the books right now from people who bought houses because the interest rates were low? And they were saying that they were going to live in it, and they turned them into rentals. And they're not really priced the same way as they should be. And now their costs are going up. You don't think that's a subprime type of loan? I mean, it's a, a lot of cases, it's fraud. It's mortgage fraud. They said they were going to live in the place, and they didn't. What do you think, Cher? He's 100% right, though. It's fraud. You're lying. You have to sign a document at the closing table. Are you going to live in this house? Yes or no? You know you're going to rent it out, never live in it? He's right. That's fraud. That's taking advantage of the system by lying. How do they, how could they get caught eventually if they want to put a claim in or something? I, honestly, I, I don't know how. I think if they continually apply for mortgages and continually, I think that's how you could cast them on if they're always applying for mortgages and they're saying they're living in all these houses. Well, that should be something to tell tell you you can't live in all those houses. Yeah, that's why when people say, we have a housing shortage. No, we don't. A ton of houses. Unfortunately, they're all empty. And a lot of people, smartly, they had to park cash somewhere. And parking it in a real estate, uh, something that's tangible, made a lot of sense. Anyway, let's go to the next one. Sherry Lillianfeld of EXP Realty, also known as Sustainable Sherry. Over 70% of short-term rental owners, they buy a property in their personal name. So they don't buy it in an LLC. Sure. When do you get insurance? You get insurance when you buy the property. So you do that at closing. You have to have insurance before you go to closing. Your mortgage company is not going to agree to the loan. So what happens is you call and you tell them, I'm buying a short-term rental property. You don't tell them it's an LLC, so they're not going to push you to the commercial division. You're buying it in your personal name. So what are they going to do? Give you a residential policy. They don't care because they're making money. The burden is on you to read your policy language, not on the insurance provider. So this is strlawguys.com, a law firm specializing in short-term rentals. strlawguys.com. What do you think, Cher? Well, here's what I, I think. So he... He's saying people are trying to get those um, insurance rates at the residential price. However, yeah. if you're buying your property in an LLC name and you're lying to your insurance company, guess what, though? When you have a claim, yes. they're going to deny it. So, who, you know, you're, you're helping yourself now, but you're going to hurt yourself in the future. Good friend who has three beautiful properties in the Outer Banks in North Carolina. These were huge, beautiful properties that could sleep over 40 people at one time. But as time progressed, he started seeing an enormous pullback in bookings and profitability. My friend began to find out that new construction was going on all around him with newer amenities, newer design, and it was starting to pull all the bookings away from him. So does that make sense? Eventually, if you're a, you're kicking butt with short-term rentals, and I have friends that just cashed in years ago, a couple of years ago, but then they got out because they saw the market changing. It's, it's like supply and demand the same way our inventory is. Um, sure, people are going to want the nicer amenities, and there's only so many people who are renting them. Jennifer came to me with 12 properties in Florida, making multi-six-figure income on her investments. Everything about these properties was pristine. I'm talking she had her pricing strategy right. Her design looked amazing. She absolutely had all the amenities. She had super properties, but none of her properties were under a commercial insurance policy. And unfortunately, the law is going to always see these properties as a commercial enterprise. If she were to be sued right now, an unscrupulous lawyer could take everything and it would be easy. Short-term rentals are the highest risk assets in the real estate space. Is that right? Because people are coming in and out. The average stay is seven days or less. If you have a successful short-term rental, you're having thousands of people come stay in your place. That's right. They're also staying there as a vacation rental. So people are having their drinks, they're having a good time. Yeah. And as a result of that, it bears out. Insurance industry says it's the highest risk real estate asset you can have. And on the litigation side, it's one of the highest risk assets you can have. So we're worried about what? We're worried about a lawsuit, but we're worried about if there is a lawsuit, can that attorney get to my personal assets yeah. if they sue my short-term rental? 
Short-term rentals are the highest risk assets in the real estate space. I don't think people realize that we haven't even got to the next level of short-term rental chaos down the shore when it comes to insurance, potential fraud, parties that are right next to your family home. What if a fire starts next door? What if something happens because they have very little setback and it affects your property? Who do you sue? The LLC, the holding company? I mean, first of all, I like short-term rentals, but when they're properly managed and maintained and regulated, there are some towns, Brigantine has no rules. Ventnor has some rules. Margate has good rules. Longport has good rules. You don't really hear about nonsense with short-term rentals that much in Margate and Longport. I, I know, like I personally have, rental properties are they short term yes they're short term but they're a month minimum like i don't do these yeah. overnight things and when i got insurance my i was very honest with my insurance company and they said are you going to be renting this out yes how long and i tell them you know so that i'm covered i just think these landlords for them to save this money on not being properly insured is is such a disaster like he said these are the highest risk highest risk properties you have all these people coming in and out their goal is to party and have a good time you have no control of what's happening there you should have good insurance and a really good liability insurance policy because that's the other thing is the uh, umbrella policy that you have over all your properties protecting you in case you get sued yeah, I see. I see all of these novice landlords. Yeah, I'm going to make some money. I'm going to get this property. I'm going to rent it out. But it's it is such a risk. You have to think about the risk. The law, and how you if you had to sue somebody, what if your ne the next door neighbor has these crazy parties? Something bad happens to your property. Something happens because of what happened on that land, that property, that short term rental. Who do you sue? The smarty guy, the smart people, not only have LLCs, but they have holding companies. Mm -hmm. Holy gee, holding, that's not me. I'm only a part of the holding company. I, I don't control, I don't own that. Holy geez. I'm sure that has to be happening, but we just don't know about it. But that's what we'll get into now. How do you identify, who do you sue? And there's a few things that you need to make sure you include in your short-term rental lease agreement. Using a short-term rental lease agreement with every single guest. A lot of people tell me, say, are you kidding me? I have to use a short-term rental lease agreement for every guest that stays at, at my property? You better believe you do. Because let me tell you what happens if you end up in court. If you go to court, I know people tell you this all the time. I'm just following the rules of Airbnb and VRBO. I'll just go in front of the judge and tell them, hey, I was following their rules and, and the platform, it, we need to, you know, that's who you need to be talking to. I want you to know right now, the platforms are nothing more than middlemen. They are nothing more than a technological facilitator of a guest, and a host. And because you are the owner of that property, I want you to know right now, the judge is not going to care what Airbnb or VRBO says. The judge is only going to care, do you have a lease and do you have a contract for which how you were supposed to behave, how they were supposed to behave? If you don't, you put yourself at immense risk and you create more liability than you should. How does one deal with short-term rentals or even mid-term rentals, like a monthly rental? Do you really need to get signatures on the agreement on all those lease agreements of anybody in that house why what did he just suggest that's that's striking to you yeah i mean what what he said look it's a lot of work yeah. i i will tell you also when i do my short-term rentals if they come through vrbo which i do use i do put together a lease agreement and have them sign it i if they don't buy the security deposit because you do have an option to buy security deposit um insurance through those platforms if they don't i make sure i collect a security deposit i mean i make sure they follow the rules and regulations of the hoa that i'm involved with so yeah it's a lot of work but he's suggesting that every person that's renting every person that's going to live in that mcmansion for saturday night or the weekend needs to be signing off on that agreement that every name needs to be on that lease agreement that, i thought that was pretty startling does that make sense to you it makes a hundred percent sense you want to know how many people are going to be there you want to know that they're all responsible if they're over 18. yeah i think it's it's a great law but unfortunately Obviously, if someone's renting for a night or two, 
they're not going to do that. It's a lot of work. Let me run this one more time so it sinks in. And there's a few things that you need to make sure you include in your short-term rental lease agreement. Using a short-term rental lease agreement with every single guest. A lot of people tell me, say, are you kidding me? I have to use a short-term rental lease agreement for every guest that stays at my property. You better believe you do. Because let me tell you what happens if you end up in court. If you go to court, I know people tell you this all the time. I'm just following the rules of Airbnb and VRBO. I'll just go in front of the judge and tell them, hey, I was following their rules and, and the platform. It, we need to, you know, that's who you need to be talking to. I want you to know right now, the platforms are nothing more than middlemen. They are nothing more than a technological facilitator of a guest and a host. And because you are the owner of that property, I want you to know right now, the judge is not going to care what Airbnb or VRBO says. The judge is only going to care, do you have a lease and do you have a contract for which how you were supposed to behave, how they were supposed to behave? If you don't, you put yourself at immense risk and you create more liability than you should. I don't know of anybody, I don't think any mayor of a South Jersey town has an understanding of what he just said. I find that most towns don't even look to their neighbors, north and south, like Ventnor keeping an eye on Margate, how they're handling stuff. Brigantine keeping an eye on Ocean City, how they handling short-term rentals. I find that doesn't happen. They don't share best practices. They don't even spy on each other's meetings to say, hey, what are they doing? Everybody operates in their own little silo. I'm almost positive of that. How many short-term rental deals identify all the guests that are gonna be there in that McMansion on that particular Saturday night. I think the percentage is, is really, really, really small. He makes a good point though, doesn't he? You get in front of a judge, he's go, what's going on here? <laughs> you, do you guys know what the rules are? Well then landlord, you're the one, you didn't make it very clear. You had 30 kids in that place. Do all 30 of those young youngsters, do they know what the rules and regs are of that, of that rental lease or that uh, short-term rental uh, agreement? Case closed, man. Landlord is guilty. Yeah, I know like in the in the rooming houses in Atlantic City, they used to have like they would have to have published rules up posted in the buildings and like they didn't have a lease per se. So so rooming houses, short term rentals, they're like hotels, right? You're gonna rent short term, you can get evicted, but they would have to have rules posted up in the buildings and things like that. I mean, I don't know if that would help a situation by not having a lease. Like if you had posted rules, that could probably help if you had that. One of the things that help in New Jersey, we have a, there's a law now that the landlords have to prove when they get their certificate of occupancies that they have an existing insurance policy in place. Now, whether that insurance policy is a personal one or a commercial one. I don't know. I don't think the municipalities look at it that closely. I think they just look at the property address and the dates that you have an active insurance policy and the minimum liability insurance. But at least it's a step in the right direction to make sure you're not just renting these places that don't have any insurance. I think we're going to start seeing a big change in the mania of Airbnb. I think this huge bubble that was formed is going to pop. And it's going to do so in a very, very big way. I think 2024, 2025, it's going to be a really challenging year to be a leveraged Airbnb host that does not have the flexibility to have 10 or 12 nights a month booked. They need to get every night they possibly can to offset these newfound costs. It's because you're going to see a lot more distress. You're going to see a lot of these hosts that are forced to sell. A lot of these hosts can't hold on. Now, many markets are still very really high. You're going to see a lot of markets where... You're going to go online and you're going to look and say, hey, these prices don't make any sense. Give it a little bit of time here. Give it a little bit of time. We're already starting to see less and less and less buyers out there ready to buy. There you go, Cher. So I thought I'd give you another webcaster who focuses on a daily basis, the real estate market. And here he is saying, hey, listen, if it hasn't affected your market yet, like in these destination towns, eventually it will start to creep in and have some effect. And I think uh, after today's webcast, uh, you pointed out through the data that we are being affected down here, maybe not as brutally as other markets, but certainly we are feeling the, the effects of a real estate readjustment, right? Is that a good word, readjustment? <laughs> or I call it stabilization of the market or yeah, yeah, yeah. readjustment for sure. Oh,